And Bishop, how are you? I'm well, thank God. We're Ron kind of everywhere. Have you noticed that? Thank the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. And I'm so glad with you to welcome our good folks back to this show. And we are so edified and encouraged all the time when Ron and I, wherever we are, we get folks who say, gee, I watch the Bishop's Corner. I listen to the Bishop's Corner. I submitted a question. And I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. It It's the reason why we do this. And we, there's really reason for doing it. Yes, and before we get to our gospel, anything you want to talk about schedule-wise? Thank you, Ron. Well, one of the things, it, this sort of sounds like a marathon. Are you ready? Okay. This is an upcoming marathon, and the marathon is for the wonderful people in the parishes where Father George Mayhas has become pastor. So Saturday, the 17th of September, I will celebrate Mass, the Vigil Mass, with Confirmation, the Sacrament of Confirmation, at Immaculate Conception, Ottaville, at the 4 p.m. Mass. Then on Sunday, September the 18th, at the 8 a.m. Mass, I will install Father George Mayhas at St. Barbara in Cloverdale. And then that same day, September 18th, at the 10.30 a.m. Mass, I will install Father George Mayhas as the pastor <laughs> of Immaculate Conception in Ottaville. Following that Mass which is, I'm sorry, that one's at 1030. Following that mass, I will be, have the joy of blessing the new rectory, which the parish was able to construct right nearby, right next to the parish church, together with Father George Mayhaus. So they're going to be so sick of seeing me <laughs> in Cloverdale and Ottaville. They're going to say, my goodness, what's he doing here for so long? But because it's a bit of a distance, what a joy that we could arrange to put all of these ceremonies Absolutely. together and to celebrate them with Father George Mayhaus and all the good people of Mecca Conception, Ottaville, and St. Barbara Cloverdale. So I very much look forward to that. And then just a note, folks. I don't know if I'll be able to go, but you should know, because he's such a great uh, speaker, Chris Stefanik, who is a lay Catholic evangelist. He's going to be speaking on Wednesday, the 21st of September at 7 p.m. at St. Wendelin in Fostoria. And I know the tickets were going like hotcakes, but you should call St. Wendell in Fostoria to see if there are tickets left. It would be well worth the opportunity to hear Chris Stefanik speak. He's a wonderful Catholic evangelist. Wonderful. Okay, Bishop, we are going to go to our gospel, which is a recent gospel from Luke. From and Ron, this is a, a long gospel, so it is a long we gospel. just get our viewers and and listeners so ready. So settle in, folks, and uh, that's it's right. Be a long one. It's the twenty from the twenty fourth Sunday of Ordinary Time. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon his arrival home he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. To you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? And here I am dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. 
While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. And the servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Your thoughts, Bishop? What an amazing gospel. And folks, we know this gospel, don't we, as the parable of the loving father or, more popularly, of the prodigal son. Some people say the prodigal father. And, of course, it's preceded by two other parables that Jesus gives. And in all that lengthy parable, I guess I would just offer something briefly because Ron has to get to these questions. (laughs) And that is this, to reflect on this terminology, he's dead to me. Have you ever heard that? I've heard people say, she's dead to me, which means they've cut someone out of their lives because either they did something that they didn't agree with or they had an irreconcilable difference but it's a popular phrase, well, they're dead to me. I would humbly suggest, friends, that we hear this word in the gospel, which is extraordinary. The father says, but your brother was dead and has come back to life. We're dead when we're caught in our own sinfulness. And we do hear, interestingly, that the young man comes to his senses. So in a sense, he was dead in sin, but came to his senses and came back to life by returning to the father in a repentant way. We're told he was, he was sorry. I've sinned against heaven and against you. They're dead to me. We know people are shocked. The Pharisees and scribes, Jesus, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Why? They were dead to the Pharisees. They just discounted them since they wouldn't keep the law or, They were public sinners. I would ask, who's dead to you? And reach out to them. And are you dead because of any sin? And reach out to the Lord, repentant, and say, as the young man did, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Because we all desire not to be dead, but to come back to life. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Let's get a question in here. Do we have uh, time? Gonna, yes, we do. We're You're terrific. Go to Cameron and wow. Toledo. Terrific. Hi, Cameron. Dear Bishop Thomas. <laughs> this is a great question, folks. <laughs> Actually, the way it begins is great. Oh, yeah. Dear Bishop Thomas, I asked my dad this question, and he <laughs> said, why not ask the bishop? <laughs> Were angels created before or after human beings? Do we become angels when we die? Thanks, Cameron. Thank you, Cameron, and thanks to your dad for directing you to us. So thanks be to God, and good for you. So Cameron, and to your dad, Cameron, uh, the first answer has to come first. Were angels created before or after human beings? So a careful note there, and it's beautiful for you to ask this question, because first we have to recognize that angels were created. So good for you for asking, were they created before or after human beings? Because we have to recognize angels, like us, are created beings. Careful distinction. Angels are pure spirits. 
we as human persons are flesh and spirit. Important distinction, which I'll get to in a minute. So the reality is the simple answer to your question is they were created before us. Why? Because we have it in sacred scripture. So the Bible actually tells us that the angels were witnesses to the creation of the world. And you know the creation story of the sun, the light, the, the dark, the animals, etc. And then finally, man and woman. It indicates they were created long before the event of the creation of the world because God asked Job, and you can look it up, Job 38, 4, 7, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation and all the angels shouted for joy? So that's the scriptural piece that we go to, Cameron, to say angels in creation came before us. The second question, do we become angels when we die? Absolutely not. Sadly, Cameron, we hear this all the time. Oh, my mother died and now she's an angel in heaven. Absolutely not. She is not an angel. We do not become angels when we die. No disrespect for people who think their parents might be in heaven. But why, Cameron? Because we are flesh and blood, body and spirit. Angels are pure spirits. There's a confusion that when we die, we become angels. We do not because we believe in the resurrection of the dead and that our spirit will be reunited with our body, and we will then be in the glory of heaven. Jesus, when he died on the cross, did not become an angel. He ascended into heaven, body and soul. Mary was assumed into heaven, body and soul. They did not become angels. Angels are pure spirits created by the Lord as messengers. I won't get into all the places like the Annunciation where angels appear to Mary and the Annunciation to Joseph, but suffice it to say that we do not become angels when we die because we're already created beings, body and spirit. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Folks, we got to take just a quick break. We got a lot of questions to get here too. That Bishop. was a very good question. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we're back here at the Bishop's Corner. So we're, glad you stayed with us, folks. We're here with Bishop Daniel Thomas. Folks, we're always eager to get your questions. You can go to uh, uh, bishop at annunciationradio.com and uh, email your questions to the bishop. Uh, we do ask maybe you give us your first name, the parish you're from, the community you're from, something like that. So the bishop has some idea who he's speaking with. We do get a lot of questions, folks. And if you don't hear it on the first show you listen to, keep listening because you'll probably hear it down the road. And, Bishop, we're going to go to Frank at St. Joseph Maumee. Thank you, Frank, for writing. Uh, dear Bishop, I've heard that if one attends Mass and receives the Eucharist on Divine Mercy Sunday— makes the sacrament of confession in a timely manner and prays for the Pope, it removes the pain of purgatory. Is this true? And if so, is that a permanent remission from purgatory? Thanks, Frank. Now, if that's, if that's true, I'm in, I think. <laughs> you know? Well, I think the simple answer to this, Frank, and thank you so much for posing the question, the simple answer is we need to learn about <laughs> what? Oh, no. Now, what? what? Indulgences. Indulgences. I think Ron cheated there, cause, <laughs> folks, because there's somebody yeah. else in the studio the staff who was feeding that answer. <laughs> but so the simple question, the simple question that you ask is easily answerable by the word indulgences. So I would suggest, and as you know, go right to the sources. So I would suggest you go to the Vatican website under Roman Coria, Tribunals, Apostolic Penitentiary, and you can find all the information of how one gains an indulgence. The careful thing there, though, Frank, is you say, is that permanent remission from purgatory. Well, 
when we receive an indulgence as is attached to Divine Mercy Sunday, and in which there are those things which are required for the remission of the entire temporal punishment due to sin, so that no further expiation is required in purgatory. However, Frank, it's up to the moment that you do that <laughs> indulgence. So is it permanent? Well, if you're, if you're going to go out and sin again, which I presume you will, because I will and we all will because we're all sinners. So does that mean that I'm not going to purgatory? We can't say that. That's not what this is saying. It's saying temporal punishment due to sin is removed at that moment. And I think those things we have to remember is it's not a permission to commit sin, nor a pardon of future sin, nor could it be granted by any power. It's not the forgiveness of the guilt of sin. It's supposed that the sin has already been forgiven in penance, for example, in confession. It's not an exemption from any other law or duty, and it's not an obligation. It does not confirm immunity from temptation. We're still going to be tempted if we do this. Least of all is an indulgence, the purchase of pardon, which secures the buyer's salvation or release of the, the soul of another from purgatory. So I would simply say, if you go to the partial indulgence, plenary indulgence, you look up their definitions, it will help you. And of course, Divine Mercy Sunday is one of those times where you can get an indulgence. We hear the Pope grants a special indulgence for a particular year, those types of things, but it doesn't, it is not permanent. It cannot last for the sins you did not yet commit. But what, I, I think what about those of us that want a permanent one from, from our sins? We're still I think you have to lead a holy life, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not. How's that, folks, for a good response? Real good thing on that. I think that's the answer. Lead. <laughs> Yeah, lead a sinless life. Yeah, I'm sure, I think that's it. Okay, well, I have no chance of that, do I? Well, I think you can try. Okay. As uh, can we all. All right. We're going to go to Claire on social media. Thank you, Claire. What differences, dear Bishop, what differences do you notice between Mass in the United States and Mass in other places in the world? Thanks, Claire. So, Claire, we know one of the wonderful things about the uh, Holy Mass in the Catholic faith is that it is essentially the same all over the world, wherever you go. So the norms that govern Holy Mass liturgically throughout the world are the same, given to us by the Holy See with the approval of the Holy Father. Now, what would the first difference be? I would say anybody who's traveled outside or even inside the United States, if, for example, Mass in a different language. So someone might say, well, I went down south you know, to Texas. And obviously there are many, many Spanish speaking people there. We went to mass in Spanish. I didn't understand it. They'll say to me, but I could recognize the mass because it was exactly the same as mass that I have in my home parish in English. Now there are other cultural differences, Claire, for example, the mass in Africa might look and feel different because of the culture of the people and for example, their vibrant singing and perhaps dancing in the offertory procession. Those are cultural differences. Nevertheless, essentially, the Mass should look and feel very, very, very much the same. Why? Because the Mass is governed by the same universal laws for the Catholic Church throughout the world. So I just mentioned some of those differences you might see if you go to Mass outside of your home parish. All right, good. Let's go Thank you, Claire. To David, uh, who's uh, listening. David on social media. Social media. Thanks, and, David. Dear Bishop, I noticed a young woman in a parish I visited who wore a veil, and she knelt to receive Holy Communion. I was intrigued and wondered if this was sparked by the Eucharist revival. I remember years ago, maybe 20, but long before your tenure, in any case, <laughs> uh, dear Bishop Thomas. That is before my tenure. There was a request from the diocese for people not to kneel for Holy Communion. I obeyed and have stood since that time. Since the bishops were encouraging a revived love for Jesus in the Eucharist, is this something kneeling is allowed or even encouraged? Thanks, David. Well, thank you, David. And first, I have to say, you know, it's great we continue to get these questions about the National Eucharistic Revival. So it is encouraging questions so that we can come to know 
be devoted to and live out the Eucharist more authentically as Catholics. So it's already doing its job, so to speak, as a revival, because you folks are asking good questions. So one of the you, you ask, of course, that you saw someone wearing a veil kneeling to receive communion. And you should know that, obviously, that may have been a person who normally goes to Mass in the extraordinary form. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. But here's the answer to your question, David. The general instruction of the Roman Missal, imagine your surprise, go to the sources. So general instruction of the Roman Missal, number 160. The priest then takes the patent or ciborium and approaches the communicants who usually come up in procession. It is not permitted for the people, the faithful, to take the consecrated bread or the sacred chalice, pardon me, <coughs> by themselves and still less to hand them on from one to another. The norm established for the Diocese of the United States of America is, here's the answer, that Holy Communion is to be received standing unless an individual member of the faithful wishes to receive communion while kneeling. Then the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, the faithful should receive communion kneeling or standing as the conference for bishops will have determined. Then that's number 90, number 91. In distributing Holy Communion, it is to be remembered that no sacred ministers may deny the sacrament to those who seek them in a reasonable manner and are rightly disposed and are not prohibited by law by receiving them. Hence, any baptized Catholic, not prevented by law, must be admitted to Holy Communion, and therefore it is not licit to deny Holy Communion to any of Christ's faithful solely on the grounds, for example, that the person wishes to receive the Eucharist kneeling or standing. So that's a long-winded way, David, of saying that a person may, if it is their spirituality, receive kneeling. However, the norm, and this is across the board in all of the United States, the norm is to receive standing. Now, do some people kneel? The answer is yes. Is the invitation that everyone yield, kneel? The answer is no, because that's been established for the United States as the proper posture. But it doesn't do away with reverence, because if someone receives standing, they are required, invited, expected to make a profound bow as a sign of reverence for the real presence of the Eucharist before they receive. So could you kneel? Yes. Should you kneel? The norm is standing. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. We're Can we get one more, Ron? No, we can't. Oh, my. I've got maybe about 30, 40 seconds. You could. You have anything you want to talk about before our prayer and blessing? I think we should do number 12. No, we don't have time. Oh. No, we don't. My goodness, folks. He's we, so strict. We do not have time. I think we should do the prayer <laughs> and the blessing. All right. Then. Thank you. So let's pray. This, of course, is the prayer from the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let us pray. Look upon us, O God creator and ruler of all things, and that we may feel the working of your mercy, grant that we may serve you with all our heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop. And as Ron, always. I would just remind our good folks that no one should be dead to us uh, because everyone should, we should be encouraged that they should be alive in Christ Jesus. And if there's anything dead in us because of sin, like that, the prodigal son, yeah. we should make our way back to the Father as soon as we can. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Folks, we'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's Call. Blessings, folks, and thank you for being with us.